All right, why, why, don't we start, why don't we start by praying to God? Let's go. Uh, Lord God, uh, we thank you that we get together together this afternoon. God, we thank you for the rain that you've given us. Thank you for watering your creation. And God, I just uh, yeah, ask that as we sit under your word today uh, and soak in uh, your goodness, that you'd just be speaking to us, that you'd be encouraging us and convicting us. Amen. Oh, hey everyone, how you going? It's good. I'm good, thank you, Gemma. <laughs> um, my name's Coden, if you haven't met me. Um, and if you're visiting, I hope you feel welcome. I hope you feel at home. Uh, before we get started today, I just wanted to give a few birthday shout-outs. So there's quite a few over this past week. So we've had Jordan Bruce. I know she's here. Jordan Bruce had her birthday. <laughs> Megan Cooper. Christian Phoebe, Josiah Flower, Mark Morris, and then Mitch France is today if he's here. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, everyone. So we're going to be uh, doing a few things uh, this Savo. So we're going to be reading the Bible together. We're going to be praying together. And then Dev is going to come up and preach to us. So just before we get, on, get into that, I um, just wanted to... Uh, yes, yeah, so congratulations to the girl who, girls who preached this morning at the Women in the Word. So good on you, Juliet, she's right here. Well done, I heard Juliet and Julie Peacock. I heard they did a really good job, so good on you, girls. Um, sorry that the event was only capped at 20, it was just due to COVID rules. Um, so if you missed out, look forward to next year when it will be on again. Uh, the youth leaders for 2021 are getting ready um, and doing some planning. And so we're hoping to go away for a weekend, uh, but we're struggling to find a place that we can stay. So um, if you guys know of a place that can sleep about nine people on the 4th to the 6th of December, let me know, because we'd love to book the place for the youth leaders. Um, other than that, there's the Zoom prayer meeting. It's going to start at 7.30 I am this Wednesday. Dev will send out a reminder uh, in case you forget um, early early next week. Um, so, to, yep, another great opportunity to pray with the rest of the family. And I think that's the last thing besides the FIC prayer uh, video. So, we're part of a network, the FIC network, um, which is a group of churches that um, yep, love to preach the gospel. And so, this is one of them. And yeah, we'll play this video. Then I'll get. Dave Warner up to pray for us. G'day, it's Josh here from Laneway Church in Footscray in Melbourne. Thanks for praying for us. Uh, let me share a little bit about what life looks like here. Um, we've been in lockdown basically since March because of the coronavirus. And uh, churches can reopen here once we hit no new cases for 14 days. That feels like a long way away. Um, cases are dropping, praise God, but they've kind of plateaued at about 10 new cases a day. So love your prayers that this would come further under control and be able to gather again. It's hard not just for Christians, but for everyone. Um, uh, lots of people here in the inner west have had have both parents who were born overseas and one of the real hard things about the virus is that it just cuts off international travel. So many people feel really isolated and alone and have no way of knowing when they'll see their families again. There's two things you could pray for for us. Um, the first is we'd love you to pray for Christianity Explored. It's kicking off this Monday. We're running it for seven weeks. Pray that um, we'd be bold and loving as we invite our friends and they'd come along and pray that God saves them. And don't just pray this for us as a church. All across Victoria, people are running online gospel courses. Apparently, Alpha has never had as many participants as uh, these last few months. So, pray that God would be saving people all over the state. This is an incredible moment where all other hopes and joys are crumbling and people are exploring the gospel. So, pray for that. Second thing is, uh, please pray for wisdom for us as we prepare for next year. Um, pray that God would help us to continue to do the main things of praying, being devoted to him and being in his word and uh, being able to make the most of the opportunities we have next year as uh, hopefully we're able to gather again in person. Thanks for your prayers. Hello. 
It's not the first time any one person's clapped for me, so that's all right. Uh, if you'd bow your heads and pray with me, that'd be great. Uh, dear Lord, we give you thanks uh, that you are powerful and mighty and in charge of all things. Lord, we give you thanks uh, that you are the sovereign ruler of the universe and all things are in your hands. Uh, Lord, we give you thanks uh, that you have enabled us to meet together tonight, uh, to listen to your word, uh, to fellowship with each other and to be encouraged to live lives uh, that please you. Lord, we pray for Laneway Church uh, down in Victoria, not just their church, but uh, all of Victoria as they are going through such a difficult time. Lord, we give you thanks that in the midst of that strife and chaos, you are bringing people to yourself. We give you thanks uh, for those awesome numbers here you just said with uh, the Alpha course, and we pray uh, for Christianity Explored at Laneway Church uh, coming up. We pray that that is a uh, effective time where people will join your kingdom. Lord, we pray for the people attending, whether that uh, online and people inviting, that they will be bold to ask more people along. And we also pray for Josh and his team as they plan for next year. Uh, we just pray that uh, you will help them be wise navigating coming out of uh, the corona lockdowns uh, and that they will be able to get church running smoothly and quickly again. Lord, we pray similar things for our church leadership here. We give you thanks for uh, Chris and Dev and Marty and uh, Coden uh, and all the other members of the team in leadership. Lord, we just pray that as they plan for next year, uh, we pray that they will be wise and relying on you first as they make decisions about how things will look moving forward. Uh, likewise, we pray for the youth team uh, under Coden uh, as planning for next year happens. We give you thanks for uh, heaps of youth coming along lately and for the uh, evangelism training night on Friday. Uh, Lord, we pray that um, yeah, you will continue to uh, reach out to the youth in this area and have more and more come to know you uh, and be challenged to live uh, lives that glorify you. Uh, Lord, a little close, uh, Lord, thinking in the next couple of weeks, we're praying for the life course starting here. We pray that you'll help us um, have connections with people in our community that we can invite along, that people won't be intimidated coming into church, uh, but really that will actually take, take away any um, anxiety they have about coming to church after the course. Lord, we pray that, um, that we can reach more and more of the uh, 25,000 in our area and uh, see your kingdom flourish here. And Lord, we also pray for home groups. Uh, Lord, we give you thanks that so many have been able to go on as usual for quite a long time now. Lord, we pray that you'll uh, be with leaders and participants, uh, help them get there regularly, help them uh, dig into your word and encourage each other and support each other uh, in knowing your word better and just getting through life uh, glorifying you. Uh, Lord, we pray that also in our individual lives, uh, we pray that you will help us rely on you day by day, that you'll help us open your word uh, and spend time with you in, pray, in prayer and, and help us uh, to find ways to keep us accountable in living lives that glorify you. And lastly, Lord, we pray for special Dev as he preaches to us tonight. Uh, we pray that you will help him be clear uh, in what he says and accurately uh, open up the Bible and help us uh, to know you and your word better. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello, I'm Louise, and we're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through to 14. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. 
He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. Hello. Folks, we made it. November, second last month of 2020. Didn't think we were going to get here, but we're into a, uh, a new month. And uh, I tell you what, when you turn on the news or you look in your feed or whatever it is, however you access the news at the moment, it is um, pretty disturbing what you find, right? Pretty depressing. Uh, living in a global pandemic, there's always uh, things going on and uh, you can kind of leave uh, feeling, or, or whatever you've read, feeling pretty down and discouraged. And so when moments or, or stories, good news stories pop up, uh, then they're, they're really nice uh, when you read them, right? And so here's one, it's a little bit older, but you get the gist. And, uh, and this one is, a bride who was stood up by the groom a couple of weeks out from her wedding uh, decided to go ahead with the reception. She booked everything and paid for it all, and yet instead of getting family and friends to come and celebrate, uh, she got uh, a lot of the homeless families in the Seattle area in America uh, to come and, uh, and have a great celebration and a fancy feast. It's a cool, what a cool story. I, I wish, if I was ever in the same situation, which I haven't been, then, then I wish that, that I'd be able to do that. Uh, that'd be a cool thing uh, to do. When, when you read something like that, I don't know, this might just be me, right? But it does something inside me, right? There's a, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure there's a little biological chemical reaction, but it makes me feel good, all right? It makes me feel good when I see that, and it makes me all uh, warm and gooey, warm and fuzzy inside. And uh, I wonder if it does the same thing for you, right? When, when you hear good news, uh, it makes you feel good. And I reckon that's one of the things that you and I... Probably everyone in this room is craving in 2020. It's some good news, some kind of good news, some kind of feel-good news. And maybe that uh, you're here this evening, and that's what you want to hear. You've come to church to, to be encouraged to, to hear some good news. Maybe, maybe that's why God's got you in these uber comfortable plastic seats. He's kind of sitting here ready for some good news. Whenever you turn on the news or look around your life and the things that are going on in it, maybe you feel discouraged. Our region is a region that needs hope. Isn't it? Our world is a world that really needs at the moment some kind of hope. Maybe for you personally, actually quite, uh, you're acutely aware of your shortcomings as a person. Uh, you're aware of, of your sin and the things inside are, are broken. Uh, you might even be here looking for forgiveness or grace. Maybe it's just uncertainty about life. Uh, if this year kind of teaches us anything, anything in this world is possible and you really don't know what uh, the year's going to be like. And so much so we're, we're all wishing for 2021 it may be worse. You just don't know. You really just don't know. Uh, it is uncertainty. And so you might be here looking for clarity, looking for direction or purpose in, in why you are here and what you're meant to be doing. Or for many of us, we're, we're just tired. I feel it. Uh, we approach the end of the year. It's been a hard year. And, and we need refreshment. I mean, we need joy need a reminder of God's goodness. Well, folks, it's, it's here. In this passage that Lou read out, all of that we find is, is here. And my kind of aim tonight 
as we leave this hall uh, in a little while is for us to be encouraged. All right, with the words that Jesus is saying, uh, to feel the encouragement in what he's saying. And so as he, uh, as he goes through this gospel uh, teaching, we see over the last couple of weeks, uh, we've had a couple of parables. And parables are essentially stories with an underlying spiritual message. And so Jesus often teaches uh, in, in these ways. And here he's done a series of three parables, or all quite similar, and we're in the last one uh, this week. And he's preaching to uh, the, the crowds that are around him, but specifically he's talking to a, a certain group of people. Uh, and these people are they're called chief priests or Pharisees, and the, they're the leaders of the Jewish people. All right, And he's speaking to them, and they know that he's speaking to them. All right, Verse 45 in, uh, in the previous chapter even says that they, they, are, they know that he is speaking directly about them, about them and they're not happy, right? They're not happy at all. They've been targeted. But he's trying to get his message over to them in that uh, even though what he's talking about is good news, at the moment it's bad news for them, all right? Because they are being caught in the spotlight, uh, earning their way or trying to earn their way into God's favour, well, one of the things that they would do is kind of box ticking and morality and trying to follow God's commandments uh, down to the very detail, but they weren't doing it for God's glory. They were doing it for their own promotion, all right, so that they would be made right with God through their merit, through their works in what they're trying to do. And so what they would produce then is spiritual fruit, but it was rotten. All right, it wasn't God focused, it was their focused. And here Jesus is saying, You can't earn your way to heaven. You can't earn God's grace. So Jesus says, The good news here is that you don't even need to try to earn your way to heaven. And so he tells this parable all about life in his kingdom or essentially what salvation is. So we're going to jump in here, verse 1. And in the very first couple of paragraphs, this is, this is cool because Jesus kind of summarises uh, the whole Bible up until this point in just a couple of paragraphs, right, in this story. And uh, in verse 1 he says, Jesus spoke to them in parables again, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come but they refuse to come. So here, Jesus tells a story where, where God the Father is a king. He's preparing this big kind of wedding feast. And uh, in the Jewish culture, in the Old Testament, a prophet named Isaiah uh, told of this kind of feast that would happen at the very end uh, around this Messiah or this anointed king. And so the Jews had in their mind that at the very end of all things, and where they were dead, uh, they would be in this kind of heavenly realm and it would be this big uh, Messiah feast or messianic feast where they would gather together a lot of celebration, the finest of wines, the finest of meats, and uh, there would be a lot of joy there. So they, they had this in their head uh, that this is what was going to happen. So they would associate this with God preparing this feast and then these servants would come along and invite them. And the servants here are Isaiah. They're, they're the prophets uh, all the ones that you read in the Old Testament, uh, people like King David and Moses, all these people, all the main characters of the Old Testament, they are the servants that are coming to say, hey, get ready. Get ready for this feast. You're invited into this relationship with God. So get ready for this feast. And yet, you've only got to pick up any part of the Old Testament to see that the Jews just don't get it, right? They disobey God. They wander off both physically and spiritually. They grumble. Uh, they re reject God and refuse to follow him on so many occasions. And so Jesus gets his snapshot that they're refusing to come to this feast that God has got ready for them. Then verse 4, he sent some more servants. And we cross over into the New Testament. Some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I've prepared my dinner. My oxen and, fat, and fatted cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. This is a lavish feast. Right? There's no crispy fried pigeon. 
here there's like the fat cows, there's oxen, bull, all this kind of stuff. It is lavish, unbelievable feast. It says, come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off. One to his field, another to his business. They went off to everyday things. And they, they lived as though the invitation had never, ever come. And those who didn't return to work, the rest seized his servants. There's people like John the Baptist, uh, Paul, and then Jesus' disciples. They seized the servants, mistreated them, and then killed them. And we see that, don't we, in the New Testament. We see that in the Gospels. We see that uh, in Paul's letters in the book of Acts, that, that God's servants, the ones bringing the message, get killed. They get mistreated maliciously. And then the king, God, was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. That's a picture of God's judgment coming on those who rejected the message, the invitation. And really, this is a picture of God patiently and persistently Inviting the people of Israel to this kind of end time feast, this wedding banquet, and inviting them into a relationship with him. Folks, that is good news. Not that they're rejecting it. It is good news that the God of the universe doesn't create everything and then just up and leave. He is still involved and he wants a relationship with everyone. He wants a friendship with everyone. That is good news, that God wants a relationship with those that he made. But good news is actually only news if you don't accept that news. It's only actually good because it makes a difference to you. It's accepted. And so we see this continual picture throughout the Bible of rejection of this invitation. And so God takes this rejection that he receives from his people throughout the Bible and then he actually throws the doors wide open to all who would come to him. Kind of like that good news story of the bride inviting all those to a reception to bless them uh, with a good meal. Verse 8, Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready. But those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. Now tomorrow uh, marks a big day in my household. Uh, Our eldest son Judah turns 10. Yeah, tomorrow, there he is, stuck in a little house and now eating a burger. Um, and uh, he, he's been kind of writing out, printing out uh, and handing out invitations to his mates so that they can come to a party and they can celebrate uh, that day in a couple of days' time or a few days' time. And I've noticed that the only requirement for, for them to receive an invite is friendship. Right, that's it, they're just a mate. So they get to come to his party. As far as I know, there are no non-friends coming. Or he hasn't invited any random person that he doesn't know. Which is pretty standard party preparation, right? We understand that. However, that's not how God operates. Did you notice? It's not God's standard. The invites go out long before the friendship is there. Right? The invites go out to become friends with God and so notice in the verses that there's something odd going on right there's some weird phrases uh, that they didn't deserve to come but those who were bad did those who were bad deserved to come they for some reason but those in the past they didn't deserve it and so when we look at this uh, deserve in verse 8, it's probably a better translation of it is worthy. They weren't worthy to come. And here the context is key. The Pharisees and the, the chief priests, they're only pricking up their ears because they know that it's them. They are not worthy to come. Why? 
because their worth is built on themselves. All right, it's evident in the lies and the teaching of the Pharisees as you read the Gospels that they are box tickers. It's what they like to do. All right, they're earning the respect of their peers and trying to earn their status before God. And, uh, and Jesus is saying that it's not on. Uh, the belief that because of their goodness, they are deserving of God's forgiveness. They are worthy of his grace just off their own bat because of what they do and their attitudes and, uh, and the status or the condition that they've got their own hearts in by their merit. And so we contrast that with, with verse 10, the bad. All right, These bad people, for some reason, are deserving. They are counted worthy. The bad as well as the good. And so who are these bad? Or oh, they're the socially and culturally disreputable. They're, they're the tax collectors and the prostitutes. They're the outcasts that we've been meeting all the way through Matthew's Gospel. Those who know that before God, they aren't anything. They are anything but worthy. Anything but deserving of Jesus, of God to take notice of them. They have nothing to give. And that's exactly how Jesus likes it. People knowing that they have nothing to bring him except for themselves and their brokenness. And then two, we have the good. Well, these are, these are people of social repute, uh, morally kind of good and uh, upstanding citizens. And they receive the same invite. And they, and they hear the words of Jesus. They see what Jesus is doing, what he's teaching, and they realise that their good isn't good enough. And these are some of the Pharisees, like Nicodemus that we read about, who starts to follow Jesus, like Joseph of Arimathea. He's the guy that takes Jesus off the cross and buries him in his tomb. Uh, they are morally good. In fact, I would say that there is no one in this hall that would be on their level morally. They are really, really good people. And yet, as they sit under the teaching of Jesus, they've realised we are good, but we're not good enough for a holy and a perfect God. And that's it. No matter how good you and I think we might be, we are just not good enough for the standard that God wants us to be, which is perfection. These people were morally good but spiritually bankrupt and they knew it. And so with the good and the bad, what you've got is a picture of everyone. So there's an all-encompassing invitation that goes out to all people, no matter their background, no matter their culture, no matter their race, no matter their social status, no matter their sin or their morality or immorality, an invitation goes out to everyone. Everyone is welcome. It is a picture of the gospel going out to the world, no matter the boundaries, even all the way here to Foster. Right? We are very far from Jerusalem. We are re on, on the other side of the world. If you live in Cooper Park, you are even further than everyone else. Right? In God's grace, the gospel even goes to the backwater town of Cooper Park. It is an amazing invitation that goes there. And that invitation specifically, that good news is the gospel. The good news that Jesus took our place on the cross. He subbed in and died the death that we deserved. He took the punishment and the penalty of sin and dealt with it forever on our behalf, in our place, so that you and I can have a right relationship with God, a right friendship with God. The invitation to come to him and seek mercy, to be made right with him. That's different to my son Judah's invites. His invites are going out because they're already friends. God's invites 
go out to you and me to become friends with him, even when we don't like him. Whilst we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We've all been invited to this feast, everyone in the room. And the humbling thing, according to Jesus and and the parable is, everyone in this room is not worthy of the invitation. You and I are the outsiders, aren't we? We're the complete strangers. We're the randoms who get invited. We are the anyones that the servants find roaming in the streets who really don't deserve a seat at the table, but you and I have been invited anyway. And that's humbling, isn't it? It is feel-good news. I feel it. I, I, I don't know whether you do, but I feel it because I know my heart. I know I am a filthy, sinful little maggot. That's my heart. It's evil. I am so undeserving of God to even look at me, let alone die in my place. And invite me to the biggest wedding feast ever. That is humbling. And it's not because I'm righteous. It's not because I'm good enough. I'm not. It's because God is gracious and generous enough. It's all on him. And it's what makes it amazing news. Because no matter how far away tonight you feel from God, No matter how much of a stranger you've been to God through your life, he wants to know us. He wants to know you and bring you into a right relationship with him. We haven't deserved it, we haven't earned it, not in any way. But because God is a gracious host who wants his wedding hall, his banquet hall, full to the brim, maxed out. And if that's not good enough, it gets better, right? Heaps better. I don't, I've never been to a wedding where I've put much thought into what I'm wearing, right? Because as a guy, I probably don't have many options. It's just kind of a suit and that's it. But I know that there's some in the room that spend some time thinking about what to wear for big occasions. You won't have to do that. For this wedding feast. God does it for you. Because there's only one dress code. And that is complete and utter righteousness. And God gives us the attire. He gives us the outfit. And that's the intriguing verses at the end. And so remember who Jesus is talking to. Pharisees and the chief priests. As we hit verse 11 says, but when the king came to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot, throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. Now, I, um, when I do work around the house, uh, like mowing the lawn, whippersnipping, uh, we've got chickens, so cleaning out all the poo from the chicken uh, house, and sometimes we've got big bonfires and stuff like that, uh, we like to cook meat, you know, some, sometimes at the uh, Coast CC, all in bonfires. And uh, th- there's one shirt that I have in my wardrobe that my lovely wife says I have to wear when I do all those things. It's called my, my, my dirty shirt, right? And um, because early in our marriage, I kept going through different shirts, and so all of my wardrobe was dirty. So this is my dirty shirt, right, that I use. So it has been washed, okay? And, uh, and it's still dirty, uh, and it's got all sorts of marks on it, and it smells kind of of meat juice. Uh, and so this is, my, this is my dirty shirt, right? And now, if I was out mowing the lawn and whippersnipping and sweaty and stinky... And, uh, and then AJ and I had to go out for the night. Um, I wouldn't then be wearing this shirt and then go, you know what, I'm going to skip the shower because they're overrated and I'm going to put on just a clean shirt over the top of this, right? Because it's cold out and I'm not going to wear a jumper. 
I, I would, that wouldn't make sense, would it? You'd take it off, you'd, you'd wash yourself, get dressed up and go. You would get rid of all the grossness, but that's not what this guy is doing. Now, it's tempting to read this and go, oh, man, poor guy. He's just trying to get into the wedding. It seems fun. Good food, good wine. He wants to be there. And maybe he got the wrong wedding. And now all of a sudden, verse 13's happened. He's tied up like a pig and chucked in. And there's weeping and gnashing of teeth and darkness. That seems pretty extreme for a guy who just got the wrong gig. That's not what's happening. This guy is trying to sneak into this wedding. He's gone down the back way. He's found some kind of clothes that look similar to the wedding guest and he's tried to chuck it in on and he's gone in to steal some food. This is a picture of the Jewish leadership. Right? They are trying to get into God's kingdom their own way. And you'll note that he addresses him as friend. What are you doing here, friend? That, that word friend is the same word, the same title that Jesus says of Judas when he comes to betray him in the garden. He calls him the same friend. That is someone who is not actually a friend of Jesus. They are trying to come into eternity with God on their terms, not on God's terms. And God is not having any of it. The right attire is righteousness. And it comes specifically from knowing Jesus as our Saviour. This is the cool thing. In the moment, by God's grace, that you and I repent of our sinful living and begin to follow Jesus is the same moment that God takes away our sin. Right? He gets a dirty shirt and he takes it away. But not only does he take it away, he doesn't just leave us neutral. That would be kind of nice. Right? Take all of my sin away and leave me neutral before a holy God. That's not enough for God because he's a generous God in abundance. And so what he does is he takes the righteousness, the perfection, the holiness of Jesus and then he clothes me, he clothes you in that righteousness. Isn't that unbelievable? That to God I am completely and utterly holy. Which is weird because I don't feel holy most of the time. I feel like a scumbag most of the time. But to God, I am perfect. In fact, he cannot be any more happier with me than what he is at the moment. Even when I stand before him completed and fully mature in Jesus, he is just as happy now with me as then, not because of me, but because of Jesus. Because I am clothed in his righteousness. In his holiness, I already have my outfit for the feast. And so do you if you follow him. And so one of the evidences of this, and this is where he's getting to the Pharisees, is that as I clothe myself in this righteousness, as I get used to or grow into godliness, as Peter puts it, then I begin to live in a way that reflects the God that I follow. My attitudes, my actions, my heart, my thoughts, my behaviour, all of it but begins to slowly change to be more godly and more Christ-like. The, the spiritual fruit that I produce begins to be godly and I want to live like that, not, not to earn grace, but because the grace I've been received is there. It's because of that grace and the spirit inside me that I want to live that way. And so here the Pharisees are producing fruit, but it's very different. It's on their own work and, uh, and, and they're clothed in their own kind of um, self-deserving attitude, their own merit, their own works. And Jesus can smell it a mile away. And so that's why he says, verse 13, the uncomfortable verse. Jesus wants to make it very, very clear, and he does it all the way through the Gospels. In fact, God does it all the way through Scripture. That that 
type of living was leading them to an eternity in hell, separate from God, forever. And that is true for all who go on their own way and they choose to reject that invitation of life and grace found in Jesus. Verse 13 is a scary verse and it's meant to be. Rejecting the invitation is. So folks, as we land it, there is one question that is really the dominant question throughout the passage. Have you accepted God's invitation by accepting Jesus? If you have, then fantastic. It's going to be a sweet as feast. And you might be tired, but, but hold on to that thought. We don't know exactly what it's going to be, look like or be like, but hold on to that thought. Anticipate the feast that is to come, the joy, the celebration, the perfection, the rest, the sinlessness. Our God is amazingly generous and gracious even to invite you and me to that feast. And he's still inviting people, isn't he? That's verse 9. So go into the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. Isn't that cool? God wants his banquet feast full to the brim. So will you help get the invitation out? That's our job. That's why God has you living in this region. is so that you and I can partner together by his spirit and get the invitation out. Our next Sunday is the kickoff to our life series. Four Sundays in a row. What a great opportunity to invite people along. To extend that invitation. Let them hear about the life that Jesus has to give them. There's some life cards on your seats. Grab them. They've got the details on them. Who are you going to invite this week? There's bundles of them up the back table. Would you pray for my mate John? He's my neighbour. I've been having chats to him. He's always been very resistant. I asked him to the last life series and it was a very firm no. I'm going to ask him again uh, this week if he would come. And God willing, he will. You know what? He's just had six heart attacks this year. <laughs> so maybe he's in a better place to be able to think about it and accept that offer because he knows that life is very uncertain and could be shorter than what he thinks. So would you pray for my mate John that he would come to life and that he would come to know Jesus? Who can I pray for for you? God has placed people in your life that need to know Jesus. Would you take a card and would you bring them this week? And you never know what God is going to do to someone's heart. You know what? That is one of the biggest mistakes I think I make as a Christian is underestimating what God will do to someone's soul, to someone's heart. And I shouldn't, because I know my heart and how evil it is. I know the change that he has brought on because of Jesus, and yet I still underestimate him and think that he just he won't be able to do he won't be able to do that for that person. Let's not fall into that trap of underestimating such a powerful and loving God. And maybe you're here this evening. And you haven't accepted the invitation. You know that you haven't. And you're here trying to figure things out. Maybe that's you. Coming along for a week or two, or a month or two, and you know that you haven't. Or more than that. Maybe you haven't just been coming along for a week or two, or a month or two. You've been coming along for years. And yet, if you look at it and take a look at your fruit, your life, maybe it becomes evident that you don't actually know Jesus. Yes, you're here on Sundays. Yes, you're at our coast groups midweek. Yes, you're at the different events. 
You're in the community of Coast EC. And yet maybe like the Jewish leadership, there is something, a disconnect there. There is no relationship with Jesus. There has been no repentance. Maybe you're still wearing this. Even as you walk out of this hall tonight, you are wearing this. And you are trying to put the new stuff on over this. Tonight, this week, let Jesus take it. Let him deal with it. You don't need it. Be honest with yourself because verse 13 is real. Really, really real. And it is a reality facing so many people in our region. An eternity without God. And yet, scarily, it's also a reality facing so many people. Sitting in church service after church service. Week after week because their hearts aren't right with God. On the outside, they look all right. But on the inside, there is no relationship there with Jesus. Do not be that person. The invitation is there. It's been there for thousands of years. Come to know Jesus. Ask him for forgiveness. Ask him for mercy. Be honest with yourself. Do a spiritual health check. Please, what fruit is being produced in your life and is it in keeping with repentance? Or is it not? Ask him for life. The gospel is good news. It's meant to be. It's actually meant to be feel-good news. As you feel the change in your heart and look at the changes in your life. True hope is found in Jesus. And forgiveness is made possible through him. Because God's grace is specifically for you and for me. It is there for the taking. Will you go into the region this week with it in your hearts but also on your lips as you share with those around you? And tonight or this week, would you make the good news yours if it's not already? Will you get dressed in Jesus and anticipate the feast to come? Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your generosity and for your grace. Lord, we pray that you would use us well in the region that you've placed us in. Let us be bearers of sweet, of good, of amazing news. Use us this week for your glory. Lord, we pray for many in our region to come along and hear about the life that you've got to give them, to hear the invitation to the feast. And Lord, I pray for any here tonight as they take an inward look at their hearts and their souls. I pray that you would encourage us and convict us of our need for you. Lord, we love you so much and we thank you in Jesus' beautiful, beautiful name. Amen. Thanks, Dev. Man, what a great reminder about the, uh, the feast to come. It's going to be sweet. Um, Seems like a long way off though, doesn't it? For me, I think, yeah, the feast is going to be sweet, but it seems like a long way off. I've been reflecting this week that um, we don't know that. You know, the, 2 Peter chapter 3 basically tells us that uh, tomorrow is promised to no one. In fact, the only reason that there was a today is, the because, is because God graciously delayed the return of Jesus because the full number of those he's gathering to himself hasn't come yet. And the only reason there's going to be a tomorrow, if there is, is because he's graciously put off the return of Jesus for others to respond to this invitation. And if we get to Sunday, we might not, but if we get to Sunday, it's only because of that gracious, patient delay. So I just wanted to kind of echo a Dev's appeal 
to you to, to be thinking about the opportunity we have over the next month, God willing, to invite our mates to come and hear about Jesus at our life, at our life series, there's cards on the table. Please, uh, please be praying about who you can invite. I'd appreciate prayer for myself. I'll be doing the talks over the next four Sundays. I'm doing my best to try and uh, present a case for Jesus to those who don't know him yet. So I'd appreciate prayer for that. Um, please uh, also be, um, have it on your mind and heart to be good at welcoming the guests who will be among us. I really do hope their experience of Coast DC is a friendly uh, church community. So grab the, uh, the cards. There's a bunch of them on the table there. And also make use of the social um, media stuff. You can share the event um, on Facebook or invite people there or the details on the website. But guys, I want to give you a moment just to reflect on who, who maybe God has put you in someone's life um, for this very moment to see them uh, come to, to new life in Christ. So I'm going to leave that with you and then uh, Marty's going to sing for us. sing for uh, everyone to, tonight is called We Will Go. It's one we haven't done before. It's good because you'd be less tempted to want to sing along. Um, you notice in the brackets there in the title it says, Send Us. Change it to Send Me. Is that is that where your heart's at tonight? Uh, there's a great call. There's a great message. And there's a needy region that we live in. Is your heart. Send me, God. Like uh, Isaiah in his vision of the temple. Here am I, God, send me.
Let's do it. All right, so that's it for this week. Um, remember, life next week. I'll see you there. See you guys. Baby